Welcome to the fourth seminar of the UCN and MNU seminar series this year. And today's seminar will be de uh, delivered by Dr. Paul Marshall, Director of Reef Ecological Ecology and Adjunct Associate, Associate Professor with the Centre for Biodiversity and Conservation Science at the University of Queensland. And the topic is securing the future of coral reefs in a warming world. Uh, Dr. Marshall worked with Australia's Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority for 14 years where he founded and led the climate change program and the Australian Caribbean Coral Reef Collaboration. He has authored over 100 articles on coral reefs including the milestone references, the Great Barrier Reef and climate change, a vulnerability assessment and a reef manager's guide to coral bleaching. He gained his PhD from James Cook University in 2000 and he remains closely involved in applied research as well as management and policy for reef, reef conservation. He has also had uh, over 2,500 dives in various coral reefs all over the world and he had recently had the joy of introducing his daughter to scuba diving for the first time. So I leave the floor to Dr. Paul Marshall. Thank you. Good afternoon everybody. It's uh, a real pleasure to be back in the Maldives and particularly to be here um, sharing some thoughts with you about uh, coral reefs, climate change and the future of these uh, really important ecosystems. And you might have heard in the introduction that I made a reference to one of my daughters teaching her scuba diving. I guess I felt the need to, to share some of the, um, the personal aspects to the work we all do. Anybody who works on coral reefs does it out of a deep passion. And for many of us when we think about coral reefs in the future and when we think about climate change, we're thinking about future generations. And those of us who have children or have children in our lives, um, it's very uh, easy to take the future seriously, um, to worry about the future because it's those, those children who are going to be inheriting the decisions, the results of the decisions we make now. And coral reefs are incredibly beautiful places and that's why it's so wonderful to be here in the Maldives. It's, you know, this is, if there was ever a coral reef nation, it's the Maldives. So it's a real privilege to be here working with the, Oz, the USAID and IUCN Reef Regenerate project, um, which is really looking at um, the challenges for reefs in the Maldives and how to secure um, coral reefs, a healthy future for coral reefs in this country. So what I'd like to do today is just give you a bit of an introduction to the issues of climate change and coral bleaching and why it's such a concern for coral reefs and then share some experiences from the Great Barrier Reef, from the Caribbean and here in the Indian Ocean where I've been working, to, working with coral reef managers and conservation planners to understand the risks from climate change and importantly what we can do about it. So I like to start my talks um, with painting a picture of what it is we're up against. And so these are coral reefs as we've come to know and love them. These are the, this is the, image, these are the images from postcards and from tourist brochures and anybody who's gone diving or snorkeling on reefs can't help but be overwhelmed by how beautiful they are and of course how productive they are, how important they are to local communities and to businesses. But increasingly around the world, we're seeing all of those beautiful coloured reefs undergo this terrible stress called coral bleaching. And it's interesting, when we um, just coming back from the expedition this afternoon, we, um, we, we had to um, do the transfer at a resort and we asked them whether their reefs were showing any signs of bleaching. And they were, and they were quite worried about it. But the manager said to us, but the tourists actually think it looks really beautiful. They actually are diving on these bleached reefs, not realising, of course, that when reefs go like this, they are very stressed. These reefs, these corals, are on the verge of dying. And so as dramatic and spectacular as it is, of course, it's very alarming. And this is what we're seeing more and more often. So coral bleaching is a stress response. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more shortly. But it's something that has always happened on coral reefs. 
What's new, however, is bleaching on landscape scales, mass coral bleaching events, where the entire reef landscape is being so stressed by hot water that the corals are bleaching. And I'll talk, as I said, a little bit more about what bleaching is, what causes bleaching. So while those corals are very pretty and spectacular, the stress that they're under quickly causes them to die. If the temperatures of the water stay hot enough for long enough, those stressed corals will die. And the corals here, the white one is bleached, it's still alive, it's stressed, but still alive. The rest of those corals there have died. They are now covered in a thin layer of, of algae, of seaweeds, and it's only a matter of time once those corals have died before the structure breaks down. We, ended up, we end up in a matter of five or ten years if there's not good recovery, if the reefs aren't in a healthy environment with a very degraded reef. And as gut-wrenching as that is to see what happens to reefs when they get affected by thermal stress, by these hot water events, of course it's not just the pretty corals and the fish that are in trouble, it's all of the things, all of the human activities that depend on coral reefs, whether it's fisheries, tourism, um, diving or seafood industries. In a place particularly like the Maldives, nearly everything fundamentally is connected to coral reefs. Coral reefs are the natural capital, the basic asset on which the entire economy of the Maldives is built. And you're not unique in that regard. Places in the Caribbean are similarly dependent. And even in the Great Barrier Reef, sorry, in Australia, where we have so many other sources of economic activity, the Great Barrier Reef is still a major driver of our economy, particularly in the state of Queensland. It generates $6 billion a year in economic activity in the Great Barrier Reef. So even in a place like Australia, reefs are really important. But here, in a place like the Maldives, the, the, the importance of coral reefs just can't be overstated. So why are we worried about coral bleaching? Why are we worried about uh, hot water events? Well, everybody knows that climate change is solidly with us now, and we've been seeing a uh, distinct trend of increasing global temperatures. And in fact, several records were broken again this year, um, with the hottest March on record in the world. And I think it was four months in a row where temperatures were the, were the anomaly, the temperature above normal broke records. So we're seeing incredibly hot weather and as you can see there 2016 is yet another spike of high temperatures. And so these high temperatures that are occurring on earth because of climate change are causing stress to corals because they warm the water up to a level that corals can't cope with it. And so what we've seen in this last uh, mass coral bleaching event, it's a global event, so these hot conditions are causing the oceans all around the earth to warm and this is technically known as the blob I've been reading, so the blob is this body of hot water that over the last two years has been moving around the globe as the seasons change and this is a map that's been produced using uh, data from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US. They do some of the most comprehensive forecasts of hot water events that can cause coral bleaching and showing all of the areas that are at high risk of coral bleaching. So in the areas that are coloured um, this red or brown colour, the water is so hot so warm, so much above the normal temperatures that there's a high confidence that coral bleaching will occur and it will be so bad that many corals will die. So it's quite clear that we are facing something really quite extraordinary um, on planet Earth right now and coral reefs are at the forefront of the impacts. I just want to step back a little bit now and just talk about the mechanism of coral bleaching before I come back to some of the things we've been seeing um, lately and what we might do about it. So many of you will know that corals are actually animals and they build a calcium carbonate which is a limestone skeleton. So they have a stony skeleton but the tissue on the outside is that of an animal. The little coral here, it's a needle coral, I could fit that in, my, in the palm of my hand. And you might be able to see that each one of those is a whole of little dots. And each one of those dots is an individual coral polyp. 
those coral polyps and this coral are only about one or two millimetres wide diameter. In the coral's tissue are a whole lot of microscopic plants. They're called zooxanthellae. And just like plants on, on land, they photosynthesize. So they use the sun's energy, the sunlight, to make food. That food's passed to the corals. And so corals have existed and are so successful in the world's oceans because of this partnership. So they actually get a lot of their energy from the microscopic plants, the zooxanthellae, that live in their tissue. So this partnership between plant and animal has enabled corals to be incredibly successful. So successful that this, this tiny little thing I can hold in my hand by working together with, with the algae is able to build structures you can see from space. So it's an incredibly successful partnership and it's the foundation of the incredible biodiversity that we see when we go diving or swimming on a coral reef. So while this has been a key ingredient in, in the success of corals over the last many hundreds of millions of years, it's also their Achilles heel. It's the point of great weakness for them in the context of climate change. Because as the water warms up, when it gets above the temperature that the corals are normally used to during summer or the warmest part of the year, the relationship breaks down. So these zooxanthellae, when the water gets hot, stop producing all the good nutrients that the coral needs and start producing toxic chemicals. When that happens, the coral has no choice but to get rid of those zooxanthellae. You can see here that this coral is a brownie colour. Most corals are. Although the pictures on postcards are normally bright blues and yellows and pinks, most corals are a greeny brown colour. And it's because of these zooxanthellae. So once that partnership breaks down and those zooxanthellae leave, the tissue becomes transparent. And what you're seeing through the transparent tissue is the underlying skeleton of the coral. So it's calcium carbonate, it's limestone, bright white. So this coral, as I said before, is not dead. It's stressed, there's still tissue there, it's now transparent. So that's the basics of coral bleaching. The temperatures only have to be one to one and a half degrees Celsius above the normal summer maximum temperature for about four weeks. When you get to that point, the corals start getting stressed enough that they get rid of the zooxanthellae and they start to bleach. Six to eight weeks, they're starting to get so, bleak, so stressed that they're, looking at, they're starting to die. 10 to 12 weeks at that temperature, one to one and a half degrees above the normal maximum, and the corals are really struggling to survive. So coral bleaching is a phenomenon that we're seeing now all around the world as a result of high temperatures that are causing a breakdown. The physiology of coral bleaching is extremely well known. There's no modeling, there's no conjecture. This is just a basic physiological fact. So there's a really strong link between the warming of the earth and particularly warming of the oceans and the health of coral reefs. So just a quick recap on why the climate is changing and this then brings us back to a quick thought about the role of humans in all of this. So I suspect all of you know about the greenhouse effect. It's a pretty simple idea. The earth's atmosphere acts like a blanket and as the sun comes in through the earth's atmosphere a lot of it bounces off the earth. If it wasn't for the atmosphere, a lot of that sunlight, a lot of that energy, that heat energy, would radiate back out to space and earth would be too cold for us to live in. So the atmosphere acts like a blanket that makes conditions on the earth warm enough for life as we know it. So the greenhouse effect in itself isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's absolutely essential to life on earth. But what's happening is because of the emissions largely of carbon dioxide, but there are other gases as well. Is this coming in and out or is it okay? Is it working? I feel like the microphone's coming out. We're okay? So um, because of um, emissions like carbon dioxide, this greenhouse effect is being enhanced. So less of the heat is able to escape than used to, and that's creating the war increasing the amount of warming that goes on. So that's fundamentally the process of global warming caused by the enhanced greenhouse effect. And so because we know the role of emissions from human activities in climate change, we can make projections about the future. 
and again there's a lot of science on climate change that many of you will have read but fundamentally the important message is there's a fair bit of uncertainty about the future temperatures that the earth will face because it depends on what we do in terms of our emissions if we start to reduce our emissions dramatically the earth won't get as warm if we continue the way we are, the Earth is going to get very, very warm. But the point is that even under the most optimistic scenarios, we are still going to be seeing warming for the foreseeable future. So it's not a question of if the Earth warm, continues to warm, it's a question of how much are we going to allow the Earth to warm. Before I come back to coral bleaching and the coral reef story, I'll just quickly review some of the other issues that come from climate change. Again, many of you will know about these and in fact I'd be surprised if in the Maldives people didn't know about this one because the Maldives is often used as the example globally of one of the most vulnerable nations on the planet to sea level rise. So sea level rise is a result of the warming of the oceans, which means that, that the water expands and also accelerated melt, melting of, of the ice caps. So these are, this is a real phenomenon that's, this is, again, it's not models. These are all measured changes in sea level. And so this is a really important driver of climate change concern in the Maldives. And I know a little bit about that. I've seen some of the efforts to try and adapt to it by dumping lots of sand on a reef to try and build a high island. So these are desperate measures because people are realising that climate change is a desperate challenge. We've also seen evidence of the power of storms increasing. And this is something that was pre predicted and is being now seen. So tropical storms like cyclones and hurricanes are showing signs of increasing in their intensity. And we've seen very personally the effects of great storm intensity on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, a few years ago I was doing the surveys on the Great Barrier Reef after Cyclone Yasi, and this is the before and this is the after shot. So on the, you know, while we're thinking about coral bleaching, and we'll be thinking about that a little more in a moment, we've got to also remember that the coral reefs are under multiple pressures and storms are one of those. The other issue that often doesn't get a lot of attention because it's hard to see the effects is the uh, acidification of the world's oceans. So as we continue to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at ever greater, greater concentrations, a proportion of that is absorbed by the oceans. And from a terrestrial point of view, that's a good thing. It's actually slowing the rate of warming of the Earth's atmosphere. The oceans are absorbing some of that carbon dioxide. However, that's coming at a price to the oceans. Carbon dioxide soaking into the oceans is changing the pH and it's making oceans more acidic. And already you can see here that we are at a point of ocean pH that has not been seen for 25 million years. So we are changing the most fundamental parts of the globe, like the ocean's chemistry, because of the emissions of humans. So you can tell that I'm a bit of an advocate for action on climate change. I suspect most of you are as well. There are many serious things that are coming down the track because of what's happening in the Earth's climate. But back to coral reefs. So probably the warning bells were first being rung about the challenges that were facing coral reefs um, in the Caribbean. The Caribbean coral reefs started their decline before anywhere else, possibly because they're under a lot of human pressures like pollution and overfishing, and possibly also because of um, climate patterns, they experienced some of the warming first. But at a regional level, the reefs of the Caribbean have shown a massive decline over the last 30 to 40 years. When you go diving in the Caribbean now, the majority of coral reefs have about 5 to 10% coral cover. It used to be 50 to 60. People can't even remember what that used to be like. That's what I don't want to happen in a place like this or the Great Barrier Reef. But the Great Barrier Reef sadly is showing the effects of climate change and other pressures. This is a 
major uh, synthesis of all of the monitoring information from the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see that over the entire Great Barrier Reef, we also have seen a sustained decline in the amount of coral that we have on our reefs. So even a system as big as the Great Barrier Reef, with the biggest investment in management of the ecosystem, we are still seeing serious decline. This is just dividing the area into north, central and south so that we can better understand what some of the causes of that decline is. And it differs. So the green bars are the coral bleaching or mort coral mortality caused by coral bleaching. And this is all before the current bleaching event. But we also have cyclones, which is the lighter coloured bars, and crown of thorns starfish. So you can see that we've had multiple pressures affecting the Great Barrier Reef, and the relative importance of those pressures differs in different parts of the reef. So what we're, the picture that's coming through clearly is on a global scale, coral, coral reefs are in trouble largely driven by climate change, but of course not helped at all by all the local pressures. And it's those local pressures that are the key to us being able to take action to help coral reefs. So that's a theme I'm going to come back to. Coral reefs are in trouble globally because of a combination of global pressures and local stresses. We can't tackle the global pressures ourselves. We need to be advocating for action on climate change. We also need to be doing whatever we can to build the health of the reefs at a local scale. So I'll come back to that because what we're trying to avoid is this transition happening to our reefs. So the story so far from a few places that, that we've been involved in, uh, that mass coral bleaching has occurred several times now. We had our first big bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef in 1998 and another big one in 2002. The Great Barrier Reef is 350,000 3, square kilometres. We were seeing bleaching all the way from the north, all the way to the south. The way we were surveying how much coral bleaching was occurring was by flying around in an aeroplane and looking out a window. You could see it from the air. It was absolutely dramatic and incredible spatial scale. On both of those big events, about 50 to 60% of the reefs were showing signs of serious bleaching, but we were lucky. The temperatures cooled off soon enough, and in both of those years, only about 5% of reefs suffered serious damage. So the temperatures cooled, the bleached corals were able to get their zooxanthellae back and survive. They'll grow a little bit slower, they mightn't have as much reproductive success for a little while, but fundamentally they are okay. We fear that the situation might be a little bit different this year. So just before coming here I was doing some surveys on the Great Barrier Reef for coral bleaching and we saw coral bleaching um, at reefs that we haven't seen it at before. We saw coral bleaching down to 30 metres depth and the aerial surveys that have been led by the Coral Bleaching Task Force have found that 93% of reefs in the Great Barrier Reef are affected by bleaching to some extent this year. So it is significantly worse than what we've seen before. And this is sort of an, a picture from an aeroplane where you can see all the corals that are currently bright white. So what you're, you're also seeing coral bleaching events in the Maldives. But it's important to realise that this is something that we're all going through together. This is a global mass coral bleaching event. And what you're seeing here is similar to what we've seen in other places around the world, which isn't reassuring other than you're not in it, to, you're not in it alone. So in the Maldives, you've also had coral bleaching events in 98 and in 2010. Both of those caused damage to reefs, but not the entire archipelago was affected. 2016, you have also been affected by the coral bleaching event. We've just come back from partway through an expedition that's underway right now. It's being, um, it's a cooperative venture between your government agencies, IUCN and USAID. Um, we've seen signs that confirm that coral bleaching is happening. The spatial extent of that and the severity is something that we will know at the end of this expedition. But certainly it's clear that coral bleaching is going to be a part of your planning for how to protect the reefs of the Maldives 
for the foreseeable future and it's time I think that we all took it seriously in the way we manage our ecosystems. Okay, so what can be done? It is scary, it is serious and it can easily feel daunting, it can feel hopeless. I don't think we can afford to think like that. I think that coral reefs are too, too precious, too important and there are things we can do. One thing we can do immediately is be part of the global dialogue that's campaigning for action on climate change. I know the Maldives has been part of that action for a long time because of your vulnerability. Australia um, has been a bit of an embarrassment in various parts of this. Um, on the one hand, we're complaining about our coral reefs. On the other hand, we're giving permits out for large coal developments. So that's something that I hope our government will sort out soon. But the current coral bleaching event, if there's a silver lining to it, it's that um, people are really sitting up and taking notice. And the, the sort of, in our country, the, the big dichotomy that is being drawn, you have to choose, is it coral or is it coal? Are we going to wean ourselves off uh, dirty fuels and unsustainable energy, develop, uh, energy production or are we going to move to a more sustainable future in the interests of the Great Barrier Reef? So I think we can do a lot to add our voice to the calls for reducing emissions, for, attack, for addressing climate change come from the point of view of coral reefs, if nothing else. But that's all about policy and words. What can we do? What actions can we take? And the thing that has been emerging strongly in the Great Barrier Reef and other places is the concept of resilience-based management. In the past, management of ecosystems, and especially coral reefs, was largely about just stopping bad stuff from happening. Stop pollution, stop um, fishing, whatever was the threat. And everything will be okay as long as we can do that. But now we know that's not true. It doesn't matter how effective you are at managing local stresses, you're still going to end up with coral bleaching events. So resilience-based management is about understanding that disturbances, damage, is unavoidable. What our job is as managers is to help reefs be as healthy as possible so they can bounce back after things like coral bleaching events. So that's the idea behind resilience-based management, a deeper understanding of what makes reefs healthy and what enables them to bounce back. And that's what we have to do as managers. So here's a little illustration that I put together. I put together because I had a, a quite a frightening experience. Um, after the 2002 bleaching event, we did a big, strong, we had a strong co collaboration with the US, and we were working with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to look at their coral reefs, our coral reefs, and to raise awareness about the need to take action because there was coral bleaching. We had the chance to brief the, the administrator of NOAA, the head. This guy oversees hundreds of millions of dollars of budget. Um, ex-admiral from the Navy, sort of impressive guy, and we're there and we're putting all the science, we're showing the pictures and we're trying to get them to take climate change seriously because both the US and the Australia of course at that point were not really on, the, on board with climate change and so we're trying to use coral bleaching to illustrate this. So we give this presentation that we'd spent so much time on and at the end there's just this silence and the vice admiral goes, you've convinced me. That makes my budgeting decisions so much easier. I don't have to fund coral reefs anymore. They are doomed. Go, no, no, that's not what we mean. That's not what we mean. And so what we realise is that there's a really important challenge when we're communicating about climate change in coral reefs. And I suspect many of you will be facing this challenge shortly as the coral bleaching event unfolds here. Anybody who's doing research on it. We have to be able to communicate about coral bleaching and climate change. We have to raise awareness, get people to take it seriously, but we also have to empower them to take action, not to give up. And so this is a little something I put together and this has been done in many different ways. But the idea here is that we think about coral reefs fluctuating through time and these are the three possible futures. It's a little bit abstract but it's just to illustrate the point. The first point to make is that even the most optimistic scenario doesn't have reefs coming back to what they were in the past. So we're talking about 50 to 100 years in the future. Climate change means coral reefs are not going to be like they were. This is something we just have to come to terms with. It's a difficult thing to embrace, but we have to. If we keep thinking that coral reefs will, we can keep coral reefs up here, then that's when we get hopeless. But the point about this is that this is not guaranteed. In fact, 
if we do nothing, this is the fate that reefs face. And it brings into focus this idea of a resilience threshold. Resilience is the ability of a system to bounce back, to recover from a disturbance. And if a system gets damaged past this point, it doesn't bounce back at all. It crashes and stays crashed. And so once the resilience threshold has been exceeded, you've taken away the ability of an ecosystem to repair itself. So our job as managers now is to make sure that doesn't happen. We have to keep reefs above this resilience threshold so they can continue self-sustaining and hopefully bounce back. So the difference between the worst case scenario and the best case scenario may not take us back up to here, but it could be the fundamental difference between a system that is completely failed and doesn't deliver any of the ecosystem services that people need, or one that while not as spectacular as it once was, is still an important source of ecosystem services for people. And so this is the, uh, the goal of resilience-based management, to keep the system healthy enough so they can bounce back. So I'm going to share with you now a few lessons about how we've tried to take this idea of resilience-based management as a way to convert all of the concern about climate change and coral bleaching and the demise of reefs and stop people slitting their wrists and give them hope that we can take action, that action will be meaningful. And so one of the things that we did when I was working at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was a three-step process where we first looked at the vulnerability of coral reefs. What is it about coral reefs that we're worried about? Why are they vulnerable? And what is it that we can do to build resilience? And that formed the basis for our climate change action plan. So that's now in its second phase. We've got, now got a 2012 to 2015 um, or 2017 program. And that's about all of the things that we can do to build the resilience of the Great Barrier Reef to climate change. And these things are all available online. And after our first program, we produced a whole lot of stories about what worked and what didn't, lessons learned, so that people, other people can learn from our experiences. One of the key things we've done and one of the things that we're working um, with your government here is developing a coral bleaching response plan. So one of the things that we know now is that coral bleaching is going to happen and there are things we need to do during a coral bleaching event and after a coral bleaching event to monitor, to be on top of the situation, but also to inform our management. So this has been a really important document for guiding what we do when there's a coral bleaching event. We can no longer claim that we were surprised. Coral bleaching events are going to happen and we know the conditions that cause them. So we need to be ready. So that's what um, we've done in the Great Barrier Reef and that's what is, under, is underway also here in the Maldives. But beyond bleaching events, there's a whole lot of things that you can do to make reefs healthy, to build their resilience to climate change. One of the big things that we've done in the Great Barrier Reef, one of the things that the Great Barrier Reef is most famous for is the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and the network of no-take areas, so the highly protected areas. Up until around, um, I think when the transition happened, around 2000, we only had 5% of the Great Barrier Reef in highly protected areas. But out of a recognition of the challenges that were ahead, we increased the amount of no-take areas from 5% to 30%. And you might think that that's not a big deal in a developed and relatively wealthy country. That was a huge challenge. Even in a place where the, great, where the coral reefs are part of the national identity, there are so many vested interests in people being able to access reefs and do what they like, take fish, do tourism, whatever, um, that there was a lot of people um, were concerned about losing access. So this is a challenge everywhere. Wherever you have coral reefs and you do management, invariably management involves restricting what people can do in some places. And that's never an easy process. It's a process that has been done badly in the past in some places. So the process of engagement and um, bringing people along, having people participate in the process is important, but it is an important uh, way of building resilience. One of the key threats to resilience in many places is degraded water quality. 
So we know that areas that have, reef areas that have elevated levels of nutrients, particularly nitrogen. So if you have farms that are putting fertilizers on, the nitrogen from those farms ends up in the rivers and ends up out to sea. Not as much of a problem here, I realize, although I suspect you do have problems with nutrients in some of your lagoons. What we know is that corals exposed to higher nutrients bleach at a lower temperature. It's to do with the way the zooxanthellae get nutrients, but coral reefs that are exposed to pollution bleach at a lower temperature and are more likely to die in a bleaching event. So there's action we can take. We can actually increase our efforts to reduce the amount of fertilizers that end up on the coral reef as one way of building the resilience of our coral reefs. And on the Great Barrier Reef, we've been doing that. It's cost a fortune. I think there's been $350 million spent to try and improve farming practices. It doesn't have to be that expensive, though. This is some work I, I did in, in Grenada, in, in the Caribbean. And they were worried about nutrients entering their marine protected area. It was causing algal overgrowth of the corals and stressing the corals. They wanted to know where it was coming from. They did a little bit of simple water chemistry. They realized it was coming from the streams. They went up the streams and they realized that there were four pig farms. They were hosing all of their pig waste into the stream and it was flowing out onto the reef. It cost them $10,000 to fix it. So essentially they, they increased the resilience of their reefs for a $10,000 investment. So these are the sort of things you can do to help coral reefs cope with climate change. The other thing you can do is look at where you have biodiversity hotspots. So just like Australia, the Maldives is a very big marine area. You can't manage all of it. You can't take action everywhere. So where do you choose to take action? Well, you can look at the places that are disproportionately important to the health and the resilience of the ecosystem. So in this case, we looked at one of the things we knew from our vulnerability assessment is that sea turtles were highly vulnerable to climate change for a number of reasons, not least of which that when they lay their eggs, the, temper the, the gender of the young is determined by sand temperature. So as you get warming temperatures, you end up with an increase in the number of females in the population. So that can cause problems for population viability. But how do you manage sea turtles? That's a pretty tough job. They nest all over the place and they migrate and all the rest. But what we found is that there is one island where something like 70% of the world's green sea turtles come to nest every year. And there were problems on that island. The problems were known, but they hadn't been, nobody, nobody had been willing to do anything about it because the old, more conventional approach to management of reefs was just to still stand back and stop things happening. But what was, what was going on here is that these cliffs were causing problems for the nesting turtles. These cliffs are natural. But the turtles were coming up to lay their eggs and as they were coming back they were falling over these cliffs and that's a pile of turtle bones. So every year these adult females that were responsible for ensuring the future of the turtle population were landing on their back and dying in the sun. And nobody had done anything about it because it was natural. It went, well, maybe it is, but climate change isn't. And climate change is this big pressure that's actually putting extra vulnerability on these turtles. So it's about time we compensated for that by helping them in other ways. So all we had to do was put a pool fence up a swimming pool fence. You can buy them from a hardware store and we put it along the top of this little cliff and the number of turtles that died that year went from 50 to 2. It was that simple. And so the challenge there was not a technical one, it was a policy one. There was not a policy environment that really allowed intervention, particularly with endangered species. But because of climate change we did it and it worked. So that is a way of building the resilience of sea turtles. Here's an example from Belize, which is one of the first countries to put a national ban on the taking of herbivorous fishes. So many of you might know that herbivorous fishes are the ones that eat the seaweed. And if you don't have herbivorous fishes, the seaweed overgrow the corals. They can stress and kill adult corals, but most importantly, they make it really hard for young corals to settle back onto a reef after the corals have died. And what's happening more than it used to? Corals are dying, right? 
So what we need to do is make sure that the processes by which young corals, the larval corals, can settle onto the reef and regrow are working well. Keeping seaweeds down is a key ingredient in that and herbivores are the lawn mowers we need on reefs. So what you don't want happening is people removing all the herbivores to eat because then you lose your lawn mowers and therefore you're reducing the resilience of the reef. Belize recognised this and put in place a national ban and it was a big deal. Herbivores were targeted in their fisheries. People put out traps, caught herbivores, parrot fishes, wrasses, sold them in the markets. They're not allowed to anymore. So that was a really big effort to build the resilience of their ecosystem because of their concerns about climate change. The other thing we've done in the Great Barrier Reef, and we also did this in the Caribbean to see whether we could take the idea and apply it there, is start to encourage a more strategic approach to management of our coral reefs. A lot of management is based on management plans and work plans that might be one, two, maybe five years into the future. But of course, many of the things that we need to do to tackle climate change or to build resilience are things that are going to take 10, 20, 30 years. So we need to be planning that far in advance. And some of the things are big and they have to happen soon, but it's hard to get action on them. If, you, if, the marine, if, if your Department of Environment goes to Cabinet and asks for an increase in budget of $10 million next year to build the resilience of their reefs, what's going to happen? Vince going here, sure, try again. But if you go to Cabinet and you say, listen, we've done this analysis of the threats to our coral reefs here in the Maldives, and what we're looking at now is where we want to be in 50 years' time. And you know what? Everybody wants to be in the same place in 50 years' time. Everybody wants healthy coral reefs. Everybody wants lots of fish. Everybody wants resilient reefs. So when you start from that point and work backwards, then the idea of $10 million to help build the resilience of the reefs isn't such a big deal. And in fact, you realise that it's something you can work together on. You're not asking, it's, it's not com competing with other interests. It's an interest that we all share and it's something we can put in place over the next five years rather than talking about it tomorrow. So this outlook reporting is really powerful. I will pause for an anecdote in just how powerful it can be. When we did the one in the Caribbean, we did it in a small country called St Lucia, and we compiled, so we just compiled existing information and what we know about climate change risks and vulnerability, and we start looking forward into the future about what's going to happen and what different scenarios we have to choose from in terms of our management choices. In our final sort of check-in workshop with the marine protected area managers, and we had three uh, departmental secretaries there just to sort of check in. This is what we found, this is what we're presenting, what do you think? In the course of that discussion that went for three hours, one of the departmental secretaries excused himself and came back in after a while and said to the head of the marine protected area who we're working with, the Prime Minister wants to see you immediately after this. And so he had heard about what we were doing and was so interested in using it to galvanise a multi-departmental, uh, you know, a, an intergovernmental task force that he sat her down and said, what do we need to do? And she listed the four things she's been trying to get up and running for four years and he gave approval to her right there and then because of this bigger picture view, this longer view of what needs to happen and how all the different stakeholders all have the same um, needs and expectations when you start looking further down the track. It was very powerful. One of the big shifts that needs to happen and is happening in the management of coral reefs is much stronger stewardship. We need the people who use coral reefs on a daily basis, the people who know them and love them and depend on them, to understand what's going on and to be empowered to exercise their stewardship. They care, they want to do something, let's help them do something. For too long, coral reef management has been a very top-down process. Governments do it, governments fund it, and usually people are asked to stand aside, we're going to fix it. And of course, even in places where you have fairly high compliance with the rules and a very good management infrastructure, like the Great Barrier Reef, it's still a problem way too big for a government agency to solve. 
and so we've realised that we really need in Australia to engage citizens much more in caring for reefs and taking action to protect the reefs and build resilience and that's happening elsewhere around the world. I know it's a big, a strong theme here and the Maldives is the perfect place for this. You have all of these islands where people live or resorts are operating who have strong vested interests in the future of the coral reefs. They've been living on these coral reefs for generations and we need to really allow people in those situations to be part of the solution. So there are many ways we can do that. One way is to get them involved in understanding what's happening. So citizen science is key and there's some great citizen science programs happening here in the Maldives. I think we can harness that energy even more to feed information into the government about the condition of coral reefs, but importantly the people who are measuring it are seeing it with their own eyes and they're starting to reflect what's going on. Why are all the corals white? What does this mean? What's what are we going to do about it? So it's a really powerful way of engaging. The other thing that we took from Australia and tried it out in the Caribbean and it's something we're looking at doing here as well is the Reef Guardian program. So it's a way of formalising stewardship. So stewardship is an informal idea, it's people caring over something that they don't actually necessarily have responsibility for in a formal sense. But to put a programmatic structure around it really gives people a sense of opportunity and it really helps the government agencies recognise and enable stewardship. So Reef Guardians programs is, is the sort of the way we've been doing that in the Great Barrier Reef and it's working very well in the Caribbean also. And in fact we're just about to launch a guide for coral reef managers on how to foster community stewardship. Because I think it is so important that we try to capture all of the knowledge and experiences and put them into a guidebook so that other people can do it too. So I've just tried to give you now a sense of the various ways that this idea of resilience can make its way into coral reef management and you'll note that I haven't talked a lot about marine reserves and putting lines on maps because they don't build resilience. It's what you do once the line on the map is there that matters. And so these are all programs of activity that are happening in different places around the world to make those marine protected areas, and they're not always no fishing areas, marine protected areas are just places that are delineated for extra action, extra attention. And then you've got to do the work. And this is, these are the sort of things you can do. And the list would go on and on, but of course, um, I didn't want to spend hours here, but there's some really good materials out there. I'm happy to speak to people after this if they're interested in any part of this. But resilience-based management is really um, enabling a much greater diversity of actions and actors in dealing with um, coral, coral bleaching. So I think one of the biggest challenges um, for moving forward is the fact that what goes on under the surface of the ocean is often not visible. And even people who are interested don't dive or snorkel. And so there's a real mystery about what's going on under there. And you imagine if, I was going to use the example of forest, it probably doesn't work quite so well in the Maldives. Imagine if all of the vegetation on the islands in the Maldives, if 93% of that died in two months. That's what's happening in the Great Barrier Reef right now except it's under the water so nobody sees it. So I think one of our challenges in, if you're involved in coral reef management or conservation is to help the people who don't dive, don't snorkel, who aren't already in the church or in the mosque if you like, who aren't already part of the movement need to understand what's going on and so that's a real communication challenge that we have to tackle. I think it's a personal challenge because it's about how each of us talk about these things. So just to finish up then, I'd like to just acknowledge that this is something that is a global challenge. Every coral reef area around the world has now experienced coral bleaching and everybody's struggling to deal with it. There's a whole lot of psychological um, and emotional challenges there. Anybody who cares about coral reefs and goes and sees them bleaching, it's devastating. And a lot of, I've had some very dear friends who've just given up, who have left the, the, the coral reef conservation world because they are overwhelmed. I won't do that and I hope other people won't as well because coral reefs need us more than ever. And so the, the project that's enabled me to be here now is, is, is a wonderful example of um, overseas development assistance and 
international organisations, partnering with national governments and agencies and local people to really better understand what's going on with our reefs and what we can do about it. And so when I come here and I just see how amazing the Maldives is, and I know there are lots of challenges here, but there's also just such incredible potential. You know, you have some of the most amazing coral reefs and you have a cultural history that is so tied to the marine environment. Um, challenges, yes, but this is also a place where you could possibly get it right. So I hope you do. Thank you. So I'm happy to take questions if people would like or we can chat afterwards. Thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, one of the uh, key uh, issues you mentioned was nutrient inputs and uh, as you pointed out there's, there aren't huge uh, farms in, in the Maldives but there, there is uh, quite a lot of sewage going into the sea. Uh, for Mali of course is a major source but the resorts as well, other islands. Uh, is there any way that uh, sewage inputs should be treated or handled in a way that can minimise impacts on the, on the coral reefs? No doubt. I mean there are plenty of examples of pathogens, disease agents in sewage causing problems for corals, so that's an issue right there, but certainly nutrients and in most places where there are sensitive coral reefs people are starting to move towards higher levels of treatment and on the Great Barrier Reef you can't have um, a resort on an island without having full tertiary treatment. So I think that's the goal. Obviously that's not easy to get to if you're way below there, but that's something that I would think you'd want to be moving to any place that you have coral reefs and high densities of people living there. Hi. Um, uh, I just want to ask, um, uh, when I first came here I was thinking that you're going to talk more about the coral bleaching event that is ongoing. Sorry? Coral bleaching event that is unfolding in the Maldives at the moment. Uh, since you have done, uh, as you said, some um, monitoring in, in Great Barrier Reef, how would you compare the bleaching event in the Maldives and the ongoing bleaching event in the Maldives and, and, and Great Barrier Reef? It's a little bit hard to tell just now because the, the survey is still continuing. But first impressions are that it's a similar scale of severity in terms of just the heat that you've experienced here. And everywhere that those, that sort of heat has been experienced, whether it was Hawaii or Tahiti, or the Great Barrier Reef, we've seen a lot of bleaching. So I think it's definitely a, you know, you're in the firing line here, but exactly how severe it is remains to be seen. But I think, you know, the expedition has another week to go, and I think that following those results, the Coral Reef Task Force will have all of the information and will be sharing it, and I think there will be a better place to make those comparisons then. But certainly it's broadly similar, and I think everywhere around the globe is experiencing that sort of quite serious thermal stress right now. Yeah. Um, just a question, because you worked with coral reefs for quite some time. Um, it's just that um, a lot of people don't take coral bleaching as seriously because they always recover. There was 98, there was 2002. Like, what would you say to people who say, oh, they'll recover again? I'd say I hope they're right. And I think in a place, you know, the Maldives from what I've seen so far is better placed than most places to recover well. You know, it's fundamentally healthy in the sense, and, and largely I think because it's so oceanic. So um, the, the potential to bounce back quickly is here, but it will be compromised in places where there's pollution or overfishing. So you've got the key ingredients of resilience here, but we have to be careful. We can't take that for granted. And bleaching events, in the, you know, the, what we've seen this year in the Great Barrier, sometimes they are so severe that you end up with not a lot of corals, well, when I say not a lot, so many corals are affected that the sources for recovery are also affected. But, you know, coral reefs, you'll get corals growing back in five years, but they're not the same corals that used to be there. And so once a coral reef has been seriously damaged, you lose a lot of the structure that other animals depend upon. And that's going to take a good 10 to 20 years for that structure to come back. And what's a big, the big concern is that these coral bleaching events, if they start to occur more often than that, 
then the coral reefs aren't getting a chance to bounce back. But I do think the Maldives will probably bounce back faster than most places, but you can't take it for granted. Any places where there's pollution, uh, you'll get a much slower recovery. Hi, thank you so much for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, so as you said, this is a global issue that we're all facing together. Um, there has been criticism in of the UNFCCC that they have not included enough language on oceans in their, I think the Paris Agreement was the first time that oceans were specifically mentioned, I think. Do you think uh, in your time working in coral reef ecology, there has been a movement towards more discussion on oceans and coral reefs in particular, or what do you think needs to be done that that's more discussed on the international stage? Yeah, look, that's a good question. I think that um, a lot of the processes in the UNFCCC and other global climate change arenas have been driven by people who are more comfortable with terrestrial systems. So there's been this, in a way, a natural bias. I think that has started to be addressed quite strongly in the last intergovernmental panel report. As you say, there was a special section on oceans. So I think the awareness is growing. I think it's partly driven by the fact that we're now seeing these coral bleaching events and so there is a, it's a very visible manifestation of climate change impacts on ecosystems. But I think also the other shift that's happening is people are starting to recognise just how much humans depend on coral reefs for well-being, economic activity and social well-being. And so I think that's, you know, that sort of thing is also reflected in the, in the new sustainable development goals that replaced the Millennium Development Goals, much stronger um, focus on ecosystem services and particularly the ecosystem services from coastal and marine ecosystems. So I think the awareness is growing and I think it needs to continue to grow, but the, the, the signs are positive. As well, this is a technical question, but when you mentioned the pH that has over 25 million years, how do you calculate pH across that much. What is what is the date? How do you calculate? historically you mean? Yeah. So by um, it, there's traces of of the chemistry in sediments. So you can actually dig down into the sea floor and get sediments that were laid down in earlier times. And there are signals in that that can that are indicative of the ocean chemistry past in times past. So pH. Yeah. There's some cool stuff they do there, and like yeah. you, you might know that the way they know what the atmosphere was like hundreds yeah. of thousands of years ago is by taking cores of ice yeah. that were laid down that long ago, and there's bubbles trapped in it for the little bubbles of atmosphere. So there's some pretty amazing science coming online to really help us understand how the world's changing. On behalf of IUC and Maldives and Maldives National University, I would like to thank Dr. Paul Marshall for taking some time to do this. We have our next seminar coming.